Good morning, everybody. I don't know about you, but I cannot believe that it is almost July. The month of June has just completely flown by me. And it's been over a month since I gave a garden update or tour. So I just thought I would share with you all today what is happening in my zone 6A Ohio garden at the end of June. And real quickly, I just wanted to thank all of you who are watching and who are commenting and subscribing to my channel. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the support and encouraging words. It really means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's take a look at the garden. Now starting up here in the front corner of the garden, I've got my Nicola potatoes in grow bags. And you can see these are a ways off from being ready to harvest because this foliage has not started to die down yet. But I am getting a real hankering for homegrown potatoes, so I think I'm going to dump one of these out today and see what's going on in there. And I like to do this on a tarp because it just makes cleanup a heck of a lot easier. Basically, I'm just going to get rid of these plants. <laughs> and dump this whole thing out. <laughs> and then we just dig out the potatoes. And like I said, this is a bit early, so these are more like new potatoes, maybe a little bit bigger. So I got enough to cook up for dinner there. And then all this nice organic matter and soil, I will just throw right back into my garden beds. My peas are all pretty much done at this point. Sadly, we were gone for a week earlier this month and I missed the peak week for peas. So I'm definitely going to be doing some extra fall planting. So very soon I'm gonna be cutting these all out of here. And I've already got a loofah gourd transplanted into here, which will climb up this trellis and take the place of the peas. Sharing this bed are zinnias, endive. I've got some dianthus and calendula over here. And then back here, I've got some really exciting peppers. This is a newish one called Candy Cane Chocolate Cherry and it will have chocolate striped peppers and you can see it's also got variegation on the foliage. This cute little guy is one called Basket of Fire and it is a hot pepper. And I'm really excited to see how this one looks at the end of the season because it should have really bright multicolored red, orange and yellow peppers. And then along the back here, I've got Floral Spires Basil. And this was a basil that is bred specifically for flower production. You can see it has this really nice compact mounded shape. And then later in the season, this will have these really pretty lavender spires of blooms. In my second raised bed here, I've got all kinds of things going on. A lot of flowers and herbs and vegetables all kind of tucked together. And on the last garden update video I gave, a viewer asked me to talk a little bit more about my companion planting. So the things I had planted in between my vegetable crops. And I wish I had some really great insight to give. Um, I know a lot of people are familiar with the, I think it's carrots love tomatoes and roses love something or other books. I don't do companion planting in that way. I'm not looking, when I interplant things, I'm not looking at what grows best with what. Honestly, I'm just kind of tucking things in wherever I have space. My main goal though is what I call interplanting, where I'm just trying to break up crop types. So I don't want to have a whole bunch of members of the brassica family together. So I try to break up my broccolis and my cabbages and my kohlrabis, for example, as much as possible, just planting things in between them. And that is because I have found that when they are all grouped together, the pests just kind of make a giant buffet out of them. You'll also hear this referred to as crop confusion. It's not a perfect method for stopping vegetable pests, but it does seem to help. The other thing that I like to do is plant things in between my vegetable crops that I know are going to bring in pollinators and beneficial insects. So all through the garden, you'll see a lot of things like I let my dill and my cilantro and my parsley bolt and go to flower. I leave a lot of my brassicas in after they've bolted and gone to flower. And that's because with like the cilantro and the dill and the parsley, those tiny little blooms are really loved by beneficial insects. 
and the pollinators love the flowers of bolted brassica. And it's the same idea with all of the flowers that you'll see in here, marigolds and a lot of calendula and rudbeckia. These are things that I plant primarily for the pollinators and for my own visual enjoyment. Calendula, of course, is a multi-use flower and herb, but a lot of these other things are just for the enjoyment of the pollinators and to make the garden beautiful. The other thing that is happening is that because I'm letting a lot of these plants just bolt and flower and go to seed, they're dropping seeds everywhere. And every spring I get all kinds of volunteers coming up all over the garden. All of the dill, all of the cilantro, all of the bachelor button flowers that you'll see in here, all of my rutabecchia, all of my uh, jasmine scented nicotiana, all of the borage, those are all volunteers. I didn't plant any of that. They just dropped their seeds last year and I let them come up. Now I do pull some of them if they're in the way or if they're crowding out my other plants, but for the most part, I just let them do their thing. So that's really all that my companion planting consists of. But here in this bed, I've got dill. And again, that was volunteer dill, several different varieties of carrots, kale, marigolds. This is a new variety I'm trying this year called Big Top, aptly named because it has very large flowers on compact plants. Some globe artichoke, calendula, yarrow, rhubarb. And if the rhubarb looks a little sparse, it's because I just came in here and harvested about half this plant the other day. And I actually recently learned something about harvesting rhubarb that I apparently have been doing wrong for my entire life. When you harvest these stalks, you want to get at the base of the stalk, twist and pull. Rather than cutting them off with a knife. And this is because that little bit of the stalk that remains above ground after you harvest can be an entryway for pest and disease pathogens. So I did that for the first time this year and we'll see if it makes any difference. I've already got some new growth popping up in here, so we shall see. Rainbow lights charred. Spilanthes or toothache plant. These are some green onions that actually were planted last spring, overwintered, were huge. I hacked them all back and now they're sprouting up again. And then I have a few Chinese five color peppers tucked in here as well. This bed that looks like some kind of top secret do not enter laboratory experiment is housing my peanuts. It had been a long time since I grew peanuts and I did not realize that rabbits apparently love them. So of everything in my garden, this has been the most trouble to keep the rabbits from just eating off the plants to the ground. So I'm probably going to have to keep this lovely makeshift, makeshift fencing up here all season. But you can see even after having been nibbled off, these are bouncing back and looking green and healthy and they're putting on the cutest of little blooms here. This bed has a lot of the volunteer cilantro and dill and calendula that I was talking about earlier. And they're kind of hard to see because they're teeny tiny, but I've got all kinds of little native flies and bees working these flowers right now. Back here in this corner, I've got my corn in grow tubs and I am trying glass gem in containers this year. I have to get out here very soon and thin these plants out. I like to do two seeds per spot and then thin them when they get to about this height just to make sure I get a plant in every spot. In this bed, I have one of my gardening experiments that I'm pretty pleased with. I tried overwintering bulb onions for the first time last fall. So these were started indoors last summer, transplanted out in the fall. And then I kept a row cover over these all winter. I took it off, um, I think about March. And as you can see, these are pretty darn close to being ready to harvest. These look like they'll beat my spring sown onions to maturity by about two or three weeks. I was hoping for a little bit more of a jump start on these but I think I'm gonna play around with some other varieties and see if there's any difference. This is Winteria. It's a Hungarian overwintering onion variety. So if anyone has any variety suggestions for winter onions, I'd love to hear them. I'm also gonna play around with covering these. I'm not convinced that they absolutely need winter protection here. So my plan is to do a planting with a row cover and without and see if they can make it through the winter without protection here in zone 6a. So stay tuned for that. 
This bed was just kind of taken over by bachelor buttons that volunteered and I didn't have the heart to pull them out of here and it was actually good I left them because they provided some very early food for the bees. So back here in this bed I've got another just mix of all kinds of stuff going on. My little Ben gooseberry. I've got Clancy potato which is a potato variety that grows true from seed. So I started these indoors very early this year and they're just starting to flower now, so hopefully I'll have new potatoes within a couple of weeks on these. I've got volunteer toothache plant coming up in here, the last of my endive, some Gurney Sunny Hedge sunflowers, and these are sunflowers that only grow to about three or four feet and stay really nice and stalky and compact. And then I've got volunteer sulfur cosmos and nasturtiums popping up here amidst the sunflowers. So when this all starts blooming, it should be quite lovely. And this green jungle here is my carrot bed. I've actually been harvesting a few of the very early varieties in here. The rest of these will be another couple weeks till maturity. This is a new cattle panel trellis that I put in this year. And you can see I've got two tiny baby loofah gourd plants down here. I'm hoping these do as well for me here as the ones I planted on the trellis last year. And that in a month or two, once we get really warm, these will take off and cover most of this trellis. And back in this corner, I finally got my chickens moved in. It is not the prettiest setup, but it does get the job done. As you can see, we've got a truck topper back there for a coop and shade cloth in here to give them a little shade and protection in the summer heat. But my idea was, because this was just a difficult corner of the garden, a lot of weeds, very compacted. So rather than continue to fight with it, I just decided to put my chickens in here and let them do a lot of the work for me. They will scratch up the weeds, they will loosen the soil, they will add fertilizer and hopefully eat a lot of bugs. And you can see what short work they've made of the weeds in here already. They're almost non-existent. And then when they move out of here this fall, I will plant this in cover crop. And then hopefully this will be ready to plant in warm season crops next summer. And then I've got quite a few things going on back in the in-ground part of the garden here. The first being this early tomato trial. Now, I found out that the well-known variety Early Girl is being phased out, so I wanted to try to find something to replace it. And I'm looking at a variety called Early Doll, as well as some early maturing varieties from Hungary. And so far, I cannot tell the difference between early girl and early doll. The deciding factor, of course, will be how quickly the fruit ripens and what the taste is like. So I will be sure to keep you updated. And if anyone has any favorite early varieties, please let me know in the comments below as well. Back here, I've got my all-time favorite potato, Purple Viking. This is a late maturing variety, so it's gonna be a while before these are ready to dig but I will be sure to show you the harvest because they are just beautiful coming out of the ground. Now under all this netting here, I have two types of edamame planted. I covered these after learning the hard way that rabbits were getting in and nibbling off all my seedlings. I made the mistake of, after I found that rabbits were getting in, getting some plastic chicken wire and putting it all around the base of my garden fence, thinking that that would keep the rabbits out. Not realizing that with their sharp little rabbit teeth, they just chew through plastic. So now I have a completely useless addition to my fence that's full of rabbit sized holes everywhere. So on the to-do list is replacing that with some metal chicken wire. In the meantime, I am just popping these nets over anything I plant basically. And it does a really effective job of keeping the rabbits off as well as the insect pest. So thank goodness for netting. Along this cow panel, I've got a couple cucumbers and some spaghetti squash. And guys, I'm worried. I'm worried I'm hardly gonna get any cucumbers this year. The cucumber beetles are worse now than they were the entirety of last year. I mean, they're making up for their lack of numbers last year. And cucumber beetles are notoriously difficult to treat organically, which is why a lot of people resort to seven. I won't use it in my garden, but I have already sprayed these with a pyrethrin product, Pyola, 
it hasn't had a whole lot of effect. Really one of the best ways to help protect your plants is to cover them with insect cover until they are blooming and that will at least give them a nice healthy head start but I failed to do that this year. Now cucumber beetles are one of the worst cucurbit pests so they attack cucumbers, squash, zucchini, melons, pumpkins, anything in that cucurbit family and that is because they are a vector for bacterial wilt. So the cucumber beetle feeding itself doesn't kill the plant but it's that pathogen that's in their gut that then spreads to the plant that infects it with bacterial wilt which then kills it almost overnight in some cases. So they're really a pest that you want to keep off of your cucumbers. And then one more thing that I just had to get off my chest because I actually had someone talking to me on Instagram about this and it's just one of those subjects that really irritates me. So it is in regard to these cucumber beetle traps. So you may notice these yellow sticky traps I have hanging up here. A lot of companies sell these and my irritation comes in that I feel like gar the gardening companies aren't marketing these honestly. These were never intended to protect your plants from cucumber beetles. What these sticky traps are for are scouting purposes. So for example, commercial growers will use these, they will put them up and then when they meet a certain threshold, so number of cucumber beetles found on the trap, they will start their spray programs. So this is for monitoring the presence of cucumber beetles, not for actually trapping them and keeping them off of your crops. Through here, I've got my spring planted onions. And you can see, again, these are a ways off from being harvested. These, the foliage hasn't even started to die back. And then I've got my jasmine scented Nicotiana. This was another volunteer. This is an amazing self-seeding annual. These are a night scented flower. So at about this time of night until sunset, they just emit this amazing intoxicating fragrance. But a word of warning, they are super self-seeders. So they drop millions and millions of tiny, tiny seeds. And I've been weeding them out of this onion bed the entire season. They really, really precocious. And here at the end of my onion planting, I've got another volunteer. This is Mexican marigold. This can be used as a substitute for French tarragon. The leaves have a very similar scent and flavor. And at the end of the season, these will have little yellow, little golden blooms all over them. And then peeking through here is my happy marigold mix. Here I've got way too much celery and celeriac planted, <laughs> which I've been growing celeriac for several years. For some reason, I just never grew my own celery. I'm not really sure. For some reason, I had it in my head that it was difficult to grow. It is nutrient and water hungry, but I'm finding that it's not really any more difficult than most of my other vegetables. And we use a lot of celery, so I'm happy that this is doing well. Here you can see another volunteer. This is all dill that self-seeded from last year. And interplanted with this dill, I've got beets and late planted broccoli and some mini cabbages. My late planted broccoli is not looking as nice as my early broccoli. The cabbage worms really got to it as did the rabbits, but I am getting some heads on there. And then back here, I've got some of my jalapeno plants, which are doing really well. Down this way a bit further, I've got my eggplant and some Alaska nasturtiums. This is a variegated foliage nasturtium. And these lovely, lovely rutabecchia. Again, these were all volunteer. This is another really great, really easy to grow flower that's wonderful to mix into the vegetable garden. And here I've got some of my garlic that was planted last year. And I know so many people's garlic it's kind of at the same stage and you want so badly to pick it. But if you are picking this to keep for the long term, you definitely want to wait until some more of these leaves brown and die back. If you just want to pull up a bulb or two and use it fresh, it's fine to do it now. But typically for October planted garlic, I am harvesting 4th of July and onwards. So these have at least a week, I'm guessing probably two until I start harvesting. You'll see more of the insect netting here. I'm actually using it for insects this time. This is in place to keep the cabbage worms off my Brussels sprouts as long as possible. You can see that they're starting to get kind of crowded in here, so I'm not gonna be able to leave these on much longer unless I get some higher hoops. But in the meantime, these are doing a really great job keeping the cabbage worms from completely devouring the foliage of these plants 
which then stunts their growth, which then leads to lessened yields of sprouts. So just to show you a visual example, you can see how nice and clean the leaves are in here. About two weeks ago, the cabbage worms came out in full force and completely decimated my unprotected kohlrabi foliage. I was not so concerned about this because we're at the end of the season for these. They're not really hurting the bulbs, which is the part that I'm after anyway. So I've just kind of been letting these go. But this serves to show really well what happens here when I don't do anything to protect against cabbage worms. And then back in this corner, I've got the last of my bulb fennel. I've already, as you can probably tell, started harvesting some of this. This will all need to come out very soon because fennel does not like the heat. And I've got the last of the season's cauliflower back here as well. This is a variety called Flame Star, which I really, really like. You can see it's got this pastel orange color. But this one definitely seems to be more resistant to heat and other stress than some cauliflowers I've grown in the past. So this is one I will definitely grow again. In this bed, I've got tomatillo, which is just growing like nuts, which is its nature. This amazing lemon basil. Uh, that smell is just incredible. Quite a few volunteer pansies and calendula and wild thyme. And behind me is a tall cutting marigold called, I believe it's pronounced Zochi. And you have to check out this amazing orange color. And my kids got a big kick out of these. These are some onions that did not get harvested last year, just bulbing onions. And as you can see, these have now gone to flower. But you have to love these unusual allium blooms. In the bed behind me, I've got olden boar and sun boar curly kale. And these are some of the nicest curly kales that I've grown. I'm really digging these because the cabbage worms don't seem to favor them, which is always a struggle in my garden. I've got more tomatillos back here, and those are interplanted with onions and marigolds. And then here in the very center of the garden, I've got my tiered herb planter. That's just kind of going nuts at this point, but a lot of things again have bolted and flowered. This is a Sicilian parsley. I've got more wild thyme in here, variegated thyme, ginger mint, sage, and other goodies. And again, I use this both for culinary purposes as well as for the pollinators and beneficial insects. And in this bed are my top chop collards. I've got some more globe artichoke down here. And on the opposite side of the collards, I've got a gray zucchini and some more of the hedge sunflowers planted in here. And this craziness of a bed is one of my favorites so far this year. All of this bora as you see behind me is volunteer. And this is a wonderful plant for the pollinators. And the blooms are edible. They have a slight cucumber flavor. They're really pretty frozen in ice cubes and thrown in like lemonade or sparkling water in the summer. And then tucked behind the borage, I've got calendula, pansies, chamomile, and some cauliflower in here that I already harvested, sprouting broccoli, and even a mystery cucurbit that has sprouted from I don't know where. So this bed also has a lot going on. Before this was even a bed, I just had Jerusalem artichoke planted along this barn wall. I thought that I got all of the tubers out. I did not. So now you can see them all coming up here. They will have bright yellow flowers later in the season. And of course you can eat those roots. I then decided I wanted a perennial pollinator bed. So I started putting in things like butterfly weed and butterfly bush, cat mint, um, you can see these rutabecchia and daylilies. I've got a hibiscus down at the end. And then I decided it would be a good place to stick my asparagus. So I planted asparagus in here as well. Now, asparagus is a very heavy feeder. So I'm a little concerned that having all of this stuff crowded in here at once is going to take away from my asparagus. So this is going to be a bit of an experiment to see just how much I can pack into one bed, but I'm definitely gonna have to add some extra manure compost to this at the end of the season. And back here outside of the main fenced in part of the garden are my cattle panel trellis tomatoes. 
I've got some castor beans growing as well. And behind that, I've got my no dig potato bed experiment going on, as well as a plot that I'm solarizing right now to kill the lawn. And my plan is to do a soil amendment test there. I got so many comments on my improving clay soil video with people suggesting things like gypsum and lime to improve clay, as well as people swearing that adding sand was the best thing they ever did for their clay. So I decided that I was going to take this little plot and do strips of soil amendments and see exactly what happened in an isolated or an as isolated environment as I could achieve. So stay tuned for that video as well. And here I've got the Hugo culture bed, which feels like it has been in progress for about 20 years. It's, I think it's really only been about two, but it's been a project that I just haven't devoted a lot of time to. We'll get there eventually. This year I threw some cowpea cover crop on here, and then I decided just to stick my extra plants that were bound for the compost pile anyway in here, so I've got a little bit of everything. There's marigolds and tomatoes and castor beans and volunteer potatoes and volunteer cucumbers or something. I'm not even sure. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how this ends up. The one negative of this is that the chipmunks seem to think that I've created them a lovely little chipmunk hotel and have all moved in here with this convenient locale right next to the garden. So as you can imagine, they're coming in and out of the garden doing a lot of mischief as chipmunks do. So, so that's been yet another challenge this year. Here I've got my Concord seedless grape and this is just on a cattle panel trellis. We just kind of put this up as a makeshift solution and the grape has taken over and it's gonna be permanent now but this grape has really been a trooper this thing has been used and abused and not taken care of and it still just grows like mad and produces every year and you can probably see on these fruit clusters there are some skips we had a frost right about the time that these were in bloom but there's still a decent amount of fruit set on here on the east side of the garden here I've got my elderberry planting and they are in bloom right now. I've got a little bit of elderberry rust going on, so I'm gonna to have to address that, but hopefully we'll get a crop off of these this year. And this year I added a bunch of stuff along the front edge of the garden as well. I've got my kind of potted blueberry assorted fruits and vegetables area here. Blueberries are ripening up, but my kids are snatching them as fast as they turn blue. I've got my fig my potted celery and rhubarb and gooseberry. And back in this corner, I've got my razzmatazz grapes. These are just starting to set fruit. I really need to get them out of these hanging baskets. They've been in here for like four years and they're extremely root bound, but incredibly these plants are still doing okay and they're still producing fruit. And over here is my tiered planter of Charlotte strawberries that I planted up early this spring. And considering that chipmunks were digging in here and rabbits nibbled a lot of these plants completely off. This is doing pretty well. And in the middle I've got some flowers, marigolds and sunflowers under the white cloth. I've got those under there till they get established so the rabbits don't eat them all off. So hopefully I'll be able to uncover those soon. So that pretty much covers what is going on in my zone 6a Ohio garden at the end of June. If you enjoyed today's video please consider subscribing to my channel for more garden updates. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.